Well, we want to welcome everybody to Citadel Ecumenical Church. We're here in beautiful downtown Columbia, South Carolina at 1026 Polk Street. And we're having a high time in the Lord. Why? Because they're beautiful places. Why? Because of our smiling faces. Why are you smiling? Because of the Lord, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is September, uh, February the 18th in the year of our Lord, 2018. And we're celebrating the first Sunday in Lent. And this is a time where we prepare for the coming of the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. You know, sometimes we think of this as giving time for sacrifice, where we take something away from ourselves, we give up something, candy, we give up uh, sweets, sodas, in order to suffer just a little bit with Christ on this journey. But today I want you to know that as we celebrate Lent, when whatever way you deem fit, that there are people around this earth who are not setting aside suffering, but suffering is a day of life. They bleed and suffer and even die for the cause of Christ. And Lent is an everyday thing. You know, we just recently got news from Syria about the Christians suffering there under ISIS and under the Islamic rule and how their homes were burned and how their children taken and sold into slavery. We've heard the news from India where in several providences, Churches are being burned and Christians beaten, taken into custody by the police and locked up. Women are being raped and taken advantage of. And they are in a permanent Lent, suffering for the cause of Christ. The saints of God are suffering great affliction. We even heard in Nigeria about the Christians who were in a school, the little teenage girls who were there in Boko Haram came in and kidnapped them and held them as sexual slaves and made some of them marry the older soldiers and ruined and wrecked their lives. But yet, they held on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They, in fact, were bleeding, suffering, and dying for the cause of Christ. And all over the third world, we're seeing a rise of an Islamic sword coming to slash, to cut, to drive, to force converts. And yet we stand in the middle of Lent, preparing for the crucifixion of Christ. And sometimes when we read these news articles, we are just horrified and want to respond in like manner. I'm sure you are aware of the young man in Florida who went into a school with a 
AR-15 rifle and begin to indiscriminately just kill children, teachers. And then we ask ourselves, what manner of evil is this? And just in Las Vegas, they said everything in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Well, obviously not. Sin anywhere triumphs and rules over men in exploitative and oppressive ways that a man in one of the luxurious hotels, armed to the teeth, began to shoot and kill a whole crowd of uh, uh, concert goers and left blood on the streets. And we just shake our heads. And we've seen pornography wreck homes and marriages. We've seen the filth of adult entertainment. We've seen sexual slavery. We've seen that bleeding, suffering, and dying and giving up something for Lent is just not a nicety that we can talk about anymore because there are people suffering. But as always, there is hope in the gospel. We're seeing that Jesus in the gospel of Mark today is being baptized by John. And he is put under the water and as he comes up, we see that there's a spirit parting the heavens and descending upon him like a dove. And then there's a voice from heaven saying, You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this happened in a world where there was no conflict? Wouldn't it be wonderful if this happened when all of us were at peace? But no, it did not happen that way. John, who baptized him, was taken into custody, into custody by Herod. And there he was in jail as Jesus preached the gospel. And just as we are preaching the gospel here, our brothers and sisters around the world are in great affliction. You know, you sometimes wonder, what does it take for one to be heavy at heart? What does it mean for one to suffer, to bleed, suffer, and die for Christ? You know, it doesn't have to be violence. It can just be ordinary and regular service. It could be raising your children who all of a sudden have a spirit that you don't even recognize. They are oppressive in their tongue. They're talking back. They're rebellious. And they're caught up in the foolishness of the day. They put at peril the very church and the nature of our religion. They put it at peril just in their behavior. Maybe it's in husband and wives and establishing the authority in the house. Who is it that's in charge when the whole society bends so that there'll be a disparity in income, a disparity in voice, and the society seems to be waging a fighting, a wrestling match, a boxing match, or waging a competition in every home? All the pain that we suffer, the bleeding, suffering, and dying is taking place even in the church. As one church tries and builds and reaches out to get the less fortunate, other churches are mean and spiteful and hateful. And instead of us being the family of God, we're competitors in the World Wrestling Federation. When preachers themselves carry the cross, the cross of over being overworked, the cross of not being understood, the cross of big dreams and visions, and just a few that carry them out. But I have good news. When Jesus came into the city, he said this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the good news. We have such a great tendency to believe in ourselves. We believe that we are some action hero in the days of our lives, on the edge of night, that we, by our own power and might, can overcome the circumstance. 
We believe that by our own power, by our own word, we can plant ministries. We can feed the poor. We can rescue those who are broken. But it's all for naught. Because the burden is too much. We can only be fulfilled by the power that's in the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes I'm talking with young people and they tell us how can a gospel have power how can good news have power how can the blood of a dead man 2,000 years ago have power and then they don't even know our God they know not the means the method they know not of his love they know not of his conquering intimacy and all they know is the power within themselves but Jesus says to us the time is fulfilled the kingdom of God is at hand repent and believe in the gospel you know when we look into our children and they know all of the cartoons they know all of the programs all of the sitcoms on television but they know not the word of God. We need to remind them that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You know, I'm just a man. Two arms, two legs, a head, a heart, a soul. And sometimes it seems so overwhelming when you look out at all the catastrophes, all of the brokenness, the natural disasters, the flooding of Houston, the earthquake in Mexico. What can we do? But then I find some comfort in knowing that the time is fulfilled. The Bible has spoken of natural disasters. The Bible, Jesus has said that son will be against fathers, daughters against mothers, family will be torn apart, but the gospel will remain steadfast and unmovable and unshakable. That those who are in Christ will have hope and through their faith they will triumph over evil. The end of the story has already been written. That it's not by our might, but by the blood of our Savior that we will overcome. And so I'm not concerned about Korea and the missiles that they have. I'm not concerned about Boko Haram or ISIS. I'm concerned about you and I understanding the time, understanding our role, and understanding what it is that we can do. Some of us would like to be Greek mythical heroes, a modern day Marvel heroes, where we can strike out and save the world. But it's not in these kind of actions that the Lord Jesus Christ will be lifted up. It will be in our quiet, personal, intimate prayer. It will be in our total submission to one another. It will be in our forgiving attitude. It will be and us demonstrating the love of Christ. And the Bible says, how will they know us? By the way we love one another. Though they slay us, we will love them. Though they kill us, we would offer peace to them. You know, so many times that we want to express our masculinity, our strength, our power, our might. And it seems like we have our guns to extend that, our cannons to grow that, our airplanes to supersede that, our submarines to undermine that. But it's not by our might. It's by our loving humility. It's about our complete submission. And they said, well, if we were the ones who love and they're the ones who kill, won't they kill us all? You know, in Rome, they had this idea of throwing the Christians to the lions, putting them in the Colosseum. But somehow Christianity lasted and Rome fell 
into destruction. You cannot defeat love. You cannot defeat the time set aside for the people of God. You cannot defeat the fulfillment of the time. And all these things have come to pass. In our individual lives, we're seeing trials, tribulations. We've seen the stock market fall in 2007. We've seen the com complete collapse of the real estate market. We've seen jobs lost, unemployment in our community up to 20%. But those who waited on the Lord, when the turnaround came, because of our faith, we were first in line. And we did not despair because the time is being fulfilled. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be broken families, broken people, broken things. But Jesus promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And so here we are in the ecumenical church. And all the world is spinning about us. And as a bishop... And as a member, my only responsibility is to stand steadfast and preach the word. Stand steadfast and keep my hand, my family's hand, my member's hand in the hand of God. Because we are going somewhere. We're going in the places where we are needed. We're going to preach the truth. We're going to preach love. We're going to preach turn the other cheek. We're going to preach forgiveness. We're going to preach that the arms of God are large enough to hold us all. That the heart of God is big enough to comfort us all. We're going to share with others. And we're going to share with each other that God loves us. And he loves you through us. And that he wants a better life for all of us. And so it won't be the bombs, it won't be the planes, the submarines, it won't be the sharp blades of ISIS cutting off our heads. It'll be our steadfast understanding that the time is being fulfilled and that when we lift up the name of Jesus, when we hold him high, he will draw all men unto him and every knee must bow at the name of Jesus Christ. So church today, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you and your families to be humble and submitted. I'm going to encourage you in your social settings, in your schools, in your churches. I want to encourage you in your, on your jobs, on your places of responsibility. Be humble. Be a servant. Be willing to suffer as Christ suffered. And this Lent, we will not give up bubble gum, chewing gum. This Lent, we will not say I'm forsaking ice cream. We're going to offer a living sacrifice. We're going to offer ourselves unto the world, unto salvation in Jesus Christ. And perhaps if you are ready to be a part of this great movement, as we begin to establish churches in 14 states in the South, as we begin to say in 14 countries around the world that there is a God who loves you, there is a God that's above battle, above resistance, above exploitation, there is a God who's above oppression, there is a God who wants a personal, intimate relationship with you. And his name is Jesus Christ. We want to tell them that in Sudan and Somalia. We want to tell them that in Kenya, Burundi, and Boko Fasai, and Ivory Coast, and Cameroon, and Nigeria. We want them to know in Sri Lanka and in India. We want to know in Middle Asia that God loves you. He's not a God of war. He's a God of love. It's not how many weapons, how much money, how much strength. It's about a personal relationship. And how can this happen? Well, it happens right here, right now. We must love one another. We must start a little spark here that will grow around the world. And perhaps you've heard something today that want, you want to be a spark in the kingdom of God. You want to be a star in the night sky where all men can look up and see hope because of the Lord Jesus Christ in you.
If so, then it's simple to be a part of the family of God. All you need to do is say, Lord, I've sinned. I repent from every sin. I turn from my wicked ways and I invite Jesus. Mm -hmm.